Can everybody hear me? Okay, decent? Okay, awesome. Hi everybody, welcome to Politics and Prose Bookstore. My name is Katie O'Donnell. I'm an event staffer here at Politics and Prose, where we host in-person and virtual events along with partnered and supported events, trips, and classes. For everything that we offer, you can visit our website at politics-prose.com. So before we get started today, just a few boring housekeeping items. If you haven't done so already, could you please silence your cell phone so to not disrupt the event? Um, and we're doing audience questions a little differently today, so I've passed around note cards and pens to those of you that were interested. If I haven't reached you, just give me a little wave. After I finish up here, I'll pass one out to you. And we're gonna collect the note cards and the moderator will be asking the questions today. So following Q&A, we will have a signing up here at this table, so if you have not already purchased a copy of the book, there are plenty of copies available up behind the register. And then once the event is complete, we ask that you please fold up your chairs, lean them against something sturdy to help our staff out this evening. So without further ado, the better part of this intro. Today I'm very excited to welcome Miriam Gerba to discuss her book, Creep, Accusations and Confessions. Miriam Gerba is a writer and artist. She is the author of a true crime memoir, Mean, a New York Times editor's choice. Oh, the Oprah Magazine ranked Mean as one of the best LGBTQ books of all time. Publishers Weekly describes Gerba as having a voice like no other. Her essays and criticism have appeared in the Paris Review, Time, and Four Columns. She has shown art in galleries, museums, and community centers, and currently lives in Pasadena, California. Gerba will be in conversation today with Lupita Aquino. Aquino, better known as Lupita Reads, is a passionate literary, literary enthusiast, amplifying and highlighting books written by authors of color through her Instagram blog. She currently lives in the greater Washington, D.C. area, and you can find her on Instagram at, at lupita.reads. So please join me today in welcoming to Politics and Prose, Miriam Gerba and Lupita Aquino. Hello, everyone. I'm gonna read a short excerpt from Creep. It's titled, Tell. And this is an essay that discusses the games that children play, as well as the games that adults play. And the games played in this essay are at times low stakes games, and they become high stakes games as the story progresses. Um, so I'll read a very short excerpt from it in order to set the tone. It's easy to get sucked into playing morbid games. When I was little, I happily went along with a few. I played one with Renee Jr., the daughter of the woman who gave me my second perm. She and Renee Sr. lived in a tall apartment building across the street from the used bookstore where I sometimes spent my allowance. Sycamore trees towered in a nearby park, and when their leaves turned penny-colored and crunchy, falling and carpeting the grass, they created the illusion that we lived somewhere that experienced passionate seasons. Santa Maria's seasons could be hard to detect. The closest we came to getting snow were whispers of frost that half dusted our station wagon's windshield. Hardly enough to write your name in. Renee Sr.'s face was as gorgeous as my mother's. The scar above her lip accented her beauty. Above her living room TV hung a framed cross stitch. God bless our pad. I sat on a black dining room chair in the kitchen, trying to look out the window above the sink. The sky was a boring blue. Cars chugged along Main Street. A gust of wind sent sycamore leaves scattering. Renee Sr. gathered my hair in her hands, winding it around rollers. The ragged cash my mother had paid her was stacked on the kitchen counter. Beside the money, chicken thighs defrosted. My feet rubbed the spotless linoleum floor. I liked the sensation of my tight socks gliding against it. Hold still, said Renee Sr. Quit squirming. Renee Sr. had a perm and an odd, impatient voice. She sounded how I imagined an ant would. 
dangerously high-pitched, venomous. Once her mother was done setting my hair, a grinning Renee Jr. waved at me, inviting me to her bedroom. I accepted. Renee Jr. had inherited her mother's beauty, accented by long teeth instead of a scar. Renee Jr. and I knelt on her chocolate-colored carpet. The apartment, including her room, smelled of buttered flour tortillas and fabric softener. The scent made me feel held, safe, and I couldn't wait to rinse the perm solution out of my hair so that I could sniff that fragrance again. The stuff Renee Sr. had squirted on me made my head stink and my scalp burn. Renee Jr. dumped a pile of Barbie dolls between us. Lifting one by her asymmetrical page boy, I asked, you're allowed to cut their hair? Renee Jr. petted a blonde and nodded. They're mine, she said. I can do whatever I want to them. I tried not to act envious. I wasn't allowed to cut my doll's hair or my own. My mother had put that rule in place after I tried giving myself Cleopatra bangs. With the bedroom door closed, Renee Jr.'s dolls enacted scenes inspired by US and Latin American soap operas. They yelled, wept, shook, and made murderous threats. They lied and broke promises. They trembled, got naked, and banged stiff pubic areas. Clack clack, clack. They slapped and bit. They hurt one another on purpose and laughed instead of apologizing. They cheated, broke up, got back together, and cheated again. They were lesbians. They had no choice. Renee Jr. had no male dolls. Renee Jr. carried a distraught lesbian to the open window. I hurried after her. She shrieked, I can't take it anymore, I'm gonna jump. Silhouetted against the boring blue, we watched the doll go up, pause, and then plummet. Face first, she smacked the ground unceremoniously. She's dead, I thought. Renee Jr. and I looked at each other, smiled. We had discovered something fun. Throwing dolls out the window and watching them fall 10 stories was something we probably weren't supposed to be doing. Soon, all of Renee Jr.'s dolls were scattered along the sidewalk beneath her window, contorted in death poses, and we had nothing left to play with but ourselves. Ser seriously, like, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. Woo. What an opening. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> Thank you. You know, when I first heard that you had a brand new book coming out, I was like, I will read anything you write. I didn't even care to read the synopsis. I didn't. I just went right in, got the book immediately. I was blown away by the beginning and the opening. Thank you, Lupita. Like, I was just like, what is this? What is this? <laughs> what is this? Please no. And then, you know, later I went back after I finished it. I literally finished it in like four hours. Like, I was just like, oh my pushing. goodness. I know. Whoa. I pushed through. It was so good. I loved it so much. Um, and then I got to the end and I read the synopsis and I was like, what? what? <laughs> and so it says it's an informal sociology of creeps. Yes. And so my first question is did you always know you wanted to write about creepdom? No, I did not. Um, the notion of writing about creepdom, <laughs> which is what I'm calling these creep cultures and worlds of creeps, um, what, what inspired me to want to do that was um, an experience of intimate partner violence. So I survived IPV. That relationship lasted for about three years. And on the evening that I escaped from my perpetrator, um, a loved one finally stood up to him. 
And when that loved one used the word creep to name him, it helped to break his spell. Because for the first time he was being challenged and he was being named. And so that naming unmasked him. And so that word reverberated for me, it echoed for me, and I wanted to begin examining the creep. What is the creep? So he became that sort of singular creep. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what I wanted to do was not necessarily examine him as a singular creep, but to examine all of the institutions that enabled him. Yeah. And I mean, for you in the book, as I'm also reading, like I'm kind of learning that this word creep has like a multi meaning to it. It's not just like an individual villain. Absolutely. Or, you know, someone that we call a creep. Everyone is implicated. Like Absolutely. I feel like even the reader, you know, you, you're you're creeping along, you're reading it, you're turning pages. I was glued. I was like, oh my God, am I a creep? I, I probably <laughs> am. And that, that's, but that's, I think, the reality of what you're trying to explore in the page. Absolutely. So I'm inviting, I'm gently inviting all of us to examine not necessarily our inner creep, but our potential for creepdom, right? And so you began to do that. You started interrogating your potential. And it sounds like you were doing that in terms of like voyeurism. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting here, I'm reading, I want to keep reading. Is there something wrong with me for wanting to do that, right? Yeah. And so yes, so I'm inviting all of us to do that. And in terms of creeps, I, I implicate those who are far from me and I implicate those who are very near to me too, including my own family members. I have an, an essay that is sort of an anti-tribute to my own grandfather, who was um, an incredible inspiration to me as a writer, but who also happened to be a great big creep, you know? Yeah. No, for sure. And, uh, you know, I think what I also wanted to know was in terms of the definition of creep, like, you know, we do, like, think about the behavior of it, but also the sensation of it. Absolutely. And I think you write a little bit about that. I was wondering if you could talk about, like, this, like, have you always seen the term creep like this, or is that something that you came to while you were, exp like, writing about it? I came to it as I was writing about it, and, like, as I said earlier, the word was pivotal on the evening of my escape, right? It, it played this important role. It was sort of a key. And so then I began to think about the word mo more and meditate on the word more. And I tend to be very attracted to, um, to uh, words that function as both noun and verb. Mm -hmm. And creep is one of those words. And it's such an incredibly gothic word, too. Yeah. Um, and, and because there's so uh, much analysis of gender-based violence, I figured that a gothic framework would work very, very well. Because in gothic literature, what do we have? but women sequestered in ruinous spaces held captive by villains, right? So the Gothic is a metaphor for domestic violence. Yeah, and is it similar to Mean, your, your true crime memoir? I feel like the singular term, even in the title, feels like a continuation of like, you know, your true crime memoir that you wrote in 2017, Mean. Absolutely, yes. So. Um, I wrote a true crime memoir titled Mean, and in some ways, Creep is a companion to that. In some ways, it's both prequel and sequel. Um, and I wanted to signal that through the title, and I also wanted to signal that through the texture that both books share. Um, both of them are constructed uh, along the lines of collage. There's like a collage quality to them. And so that shared texture um, places them within the same family, I think. Yeah. And I, I, I feel like I remember reading reviews when Mean first came out. And, you know, a lot of the criticism you got was in terms of like the humor, right? Or the way that you write, even refer to kind of what you went through, which I think is so messed up because it's your experience. Mm -hmm. You're allowed to process and write about mm -hmm. it in whatever way you want. Yeah. So I was curious, like, did you approach writing Creep differently because of any of In Mean, that was a book about uh, an experience of, of sexual assault that I survived when I was 19 years old that was perpetrated by a stranger uh, who went on to, to kill. Um, he was on his way to becoming a serial killer. Um, and, and, I, and I shared that experience, but um, I stylized it through humor. And there were a lot of folks who thought that um, humor and uh, true crime <laughs> don't mix. Um, 
And so in Creep, what I do is I attempt to answer those critics um, through an essay titled Slimed, where I write a reader to hang out at that crossroads with me and to understand what happens at that crossroads and why for some of us, that location is very healing. And it might not be for everybody, but for some of us it is. And, uh, and I think that, that our attraction to humor and to comedy, uh, if we are survivors, is something that ought to be honored. And so in a sense, I'm fighting for that. Yeah. Um, and I also love that you write about death. You know? <laughs> and I've, I've actually read some of your interviews and people are surprised that you write about death. Yeah. And I'm like, how? Like, it's like, <laughs> it's, like I'm I'm sorry, it's, it's like so Mexican <laughs> to write about death. And, uh, I mean, because I don't know, culturally, we're not afraid of death. Not at all. It's our favorite toy, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. And I, I love that you, I mean, it just feels so perfect in the book. And I want, was curious to, you know, to have you tell us a little bit more about, you know, writing about death and like not being afraid to confront something like death. Um, so, I had to address death directly in this collection because so much of it has to do with femicide and for the, that's devoted to my ancestors, that's devoted to my ancestors. And so I was appealing to the dead and speaking to the dead the entire time that I was working on this and they inserted themselves very strongly <laughs> into the book, strongly and loudly. And so you hear sort of a cacophony of the dead throughout the book. That's so cool because yesterday I talked to another author, Jamano Arias, about his novel, Where There Was Fire. Mm -hmm. And he said, in his bio, he says he lived with four ghosts. Mm. And those are those ghosts were his ancestors, his family, yeah. who was coming back and say, write about me. Uh -huh. Tell stories about me. Absolutely. So I feel like that's so fitting for, for Creep. And, you know, do you have the, a lot of that experience happen to you, even with Meme? Yes. Yes. So... When I wrote Mean, it was in part to explain to others uh, what the experience of being haunted is. Because as I mentioned earlier, I experienced a sexual assault when I was 19. The perpetrator went on to kill, right? And I felt very haunted by uh, one of my perpetrator's victims because I got this feeling, I have to carry this feeling that he practiced on me what he did to her. Mm. And so she and I have this very intimate connection. Um, and we are, we and the other victims, so, so that particular victim I, and I and the other victims, we're the only ones who know what it's like mm. to encounter that perpetrator under those circumstances. And so we form sort of a macabre sisterhood. Mm. And then, um, and then, and then the victim who lost her life, I've always felt her to be very strongly with me since she lost her life. And, and I, I don't ever want her to be forgotten. And so Mean is an account that I hope ensures that, that her spirit has longevity and that it's remembered. Yeah. And, and I think in that sense, that's why death is not a scary thing mm -hmm. because it's not for at least for us we don't see yeah. it as an end no 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 it's you not know? an end at all and then um i am also very interested uh in uh honoring santa muerte saint death and so i do include uh santa muerte as part of my spiritual practice and and santa muerte for those who are unfamiliar is the embodiment of death she's the personification of death and uh Folks who are, who are unfamiliar tend to think of her as this incredibly spooky character, but those who beseech her the most are those who are in most dire need. Yeah. And she's appealed to quite a bit by women and quite a bit by queer folks. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't know that. You know, mm -hmm. they see these statues and these things and they're like, I don't, I don't it feels foreign yes. and scary, but it's actually not if you learn and learn exactly. about it. Um, in terms of your range of creeps that you explore <laughs> throughout history, <laughs> I loved just seeing such a range of different people. And I was curious how you picked which person, which figure you were going to explore. And, and, and for those who haven't read it, we're talking Joan DeLeon, um, I think a writer, James Boris 
Stuart Boris the second. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a bunch of people that you really um, explore. So what I what I attempt to do by examining these various creeps is to demonstrate how they sort of crept into various genealogies from which I descend. And so uh, all writers are situated within literary genealogies. And sometimes we're influenced by creeps. We can't help that, right? And so what I attempt to do is reckon with those figures who are influential to me, who I consider part of various genealogies. They might be literary genealogies, cultural genealogies, or actual familial um, uh, kin. So I, I plucked from those various categories in order to try to construct uh, my world. Um, in particular, my sort of vision of California, because so much of this is either set in California or somehow implicates California too. And California herself in, in some regards becomes a creep. Yeah. Um, and so what I'm doing by assembling all of these creeps is I'm scaffolding the reader up to the capstone essay, which is the title essay, Creep. And so by the time the reader arrives there, the reader very much knows who and what produced me, especially in terms of creepy cultures that I've traveled through. Yeah. And, you know, was, was the choice between, but behind having your, like, image on the cover part of that implication that no one is free of creepdom? Or what was so the I had not that? thought about it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm just curious. But, um, no, no, no. Like, like uh, m my my editor was the one who suggested that that um, that my my portrait be on the cover, and she did that, or she suggested it because um, uh, it was intended to poke fun at Didion appearing on her covers, right. and because I I you know, take my sword and chop down Didion. She figured that it would be kind of kind of a nod at that. But I am also implicated, like you said, in the world of, of creeps. And I know that I am considered one, in particular because of the activism that I do. I know that the right thinks I'm a creep. I know that fascists think I'm a creep. And so it's undeniable that I'm going to be seen as one, too. So of course, I have to frame myself as one. <laughs> but it's, it's so interesting though right that I mean I think when you all read this if you have read it then you do know that the that implication that discovery um, I'm curious about your reactions from uh, from readers so far since the book's been out have you been approached and and, and been told the same thing like hey I, f I feel like a creep but in a good way because I feel like I'm in, I'm exploring internal creepdom and biases that I didn't know I had Interestingly, thus far, there has been one person who, who, who did huh. uh, say to me, you know, as I was reading the book, I began to wonder whether or not I'm a creep. And then he started to, like, assess his behavior with women. Uh, and I was like, to, you? to me. Oh, and great. I was like, perhaps I'm not the right person for this. I'm not your confessor, but there's a Catholic church down the street. You know, like, <laughs> show yourself into it. Yeah. Right. No, that's because you've got to pay me for, for that. For. Yeah. Right. I was not hoping for that. I was hoping more for like, hey, you yeah. know, this opened my eyes in, in terms of the ways in which, yeah, like this whole idea of creepdom, like, flows through us in society so naturally and uh, sometimes we don't know it right you know what i just I, I i i have remembered now another person too so now actually there was two um i did have another person tell me that they were so distraught by um what i had written in the essay slimed huh. um that they had to go speak to their therapist about it um, because they felt implicated as a creep through their use of humor. Wow. And so they went to go process their use of humor with their therapist. But that's as a helpful. result of that. I, always, I totally think so. I feel like there's been plenty of times where I process books with my therapist. <laughs> and it's been always helpful. I highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, I was really flattered that my writing drove somebody to the therapist. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it's for change, why not, right? Yeah. To make better people in totally. the world. I mean, I don't know, why not? Um, so I want to talk about craft a little bit because yes. a lot. So, as you mentioned, you know you're you're building. You 
know, you're mm-hmm. building, you're connecting. I feel like every essay I left, I was just mind blown by the connections that you made. Um, and so there was something that you said about, you know, craft, the craft of memoir in an interview. You said typically people approach memoir narratively and chronologically, but I was thinking of memoir more as a kind of installation work. So I was wondering if you could talk about your approach to writing memoir and how you came about that approach. Um, so I do think of memoir as an assemblage of sorts. And I do think that f- for me, it's more effective when I'm attempting to share who I am with somebody by, for example, inviting them into a room, inviting them into a place. And so with creep, it's not so much that I'm telling stories as it is that I'm creating a place. Yeah. I'm reproducing a place and um, I'm inviting the reader as a guest into that place. And that place is highly curated. And so I, I think of, of, of this work as, as a bit of installation art. And so in that sense, I, um, I do develop sort of a list of features that I want to have in the work and then begin considering um, almost like geospatially, how am I going to arrange all of these pieces? And then I begin to start thinking about those pieces as a puzzle. Mm. And how am I going to arrange that puzzle? And where are the missing pieces of the puzzle? Yeah, and I mean, I think what you end up seeing when you read it, you see the puzzle come together and you realize how everything's connected. And every essay does that, like, (laughs) without miss. And you list your sources Mm -hmm. at the end of this book, which are pretty extensive. Mm -hmm. So how much research went into like making those connections and then also like, hey, I'm going to source the hell out of this because (laughs) there's no way that no one's going to say this isn't connected somehow. Yeah, absolutely. So I did I did quite a bit of research um, for the book and some of it isn't cited. And by that, I mean, I conducted interviews. Mm -hmm. Um, with folks and and especially interviews with family members because I have uh, an essay called Locas which is about my relationship with my cousin Desiree Um, and we took very different paths in life. Um, I became um, a teacher and a writer and she became a gangster who was incarcerated for 15 years as a result of her criminalization. And so I interviewed her extensively about her experiences. And then those interviews came to form the backbone of the Locas essay. And then something else that I did also when I was working on that essay, just to give an example of how this um, plays out in the writing of an essay, um, there had been crime reporting done on her life. Mm -hmm. And most of her life had either been documented by crime reporters or by the state. And she said, that's not who I am. That's an incomplete version of my story. You've been there my whole life, Medium. You tell it. You fill the holes. And so we work together to do that. That was like one of my, I mean, I've, there was, I cannot say I have a favorite essay, but <laughs> if someone was like, pick one, I would have to pick that one. Because it was so powerful to, for you to just be able to like fold out the ways in which systems that are creeps that mm-hmm. creep on people and oppress people fail people absolutely and that was part of uh that was very much one of my goals and i got pushback from um some of the copy editors too in that i would describe prison as a creep right yeah. or i would describe insurance companies as creeps but they are and creeps. yeah <laughs> and the copy editor would say no 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 no, no these are not people i said yes they are yeah. what is a prison but a group of people yeah. what is an insurance company but a group of people so they're all creeping together like a slime mold. So we can, <laughs> we can call them creeps. Yeah. I mean, it's this also idea that you can't implicate a system. Exactly. But a system is, it's, it, it exists. It's a collection it, of it's people. It's a collection of people. Mm-hmm. Um, I do know we're going to be turning the audience questions t- like soon. So if you do have a question, um, the booksellers gave a, away note cards that you can write your question on. But um, before we do that, I want to kind of get into something that surprised me about the collection, mm-hmm. um, which is the inclusion of your, <laughs> your I'm going to say, review and literary criticism of American Dirt, mm-hmm. which a lot of, a, a, de- a good deal of people came to know you by. Yeah. Um, and so at first I was surprised by it, but then when I finished it, I was like, 
Whoa, it makes sense <laughs> to have included this. Mm -hmm. So I was curious about the decision to include it. Like, was did you struggle with it? Were you like, does it need to be in here? Or what did you? So um, there was a little bit of back and forth with my editor about that essay's inclusion. And ultimately, I decided to include it because it's, it's something that I can't get away from. It's something that, that I wrote that became quite popular. And it's, it, it's a piece of criticism that in the eyes of some implicates me as a creep, but that criticism implicates the publishing industry as a creep. And so I place it there, I place it within this essay to frame it. And one of the other reasons that I wanted that essay in this collection is because so frequently uh, when that essay has been written about, it's described as a blog post. It was never a blog post. It was in an academic journal. Now, people will have to say it's in a book. <laughs> right. And, but before, I mean, I think you explain in, in the book that before it was supposed to be, you know, published somewhere and then mm -hmm. it, you got kill piece money for it, right? Yes. It was supposed to be published in a Ms. Magazine. Yeah. And so they had commissioned me to do it. It was my second review for Ms. There had been n no issue or no issues with my first review, but this second review seemed to cause problems. And I was given an ultimatum. I was told that um, if I wanted the review to be published by the magazine, I had to say something nice about the book. <laughs> and I thought that that was bullshit. Yeah. I wasn't gonna do that. And I told them, I said, I can't say anything nice about this book. So you can kill the um the piece but i i'm not i don't do advertising i do criticism yeah. so yeah and i feel like we were both kind of part of the american dirt yes. thing <laughs> and i you know i know it's been so exhausting to continue to have these conversations around the book and you know honestly like a lot of what happened was just criticism literary criticism yeah. and and actually taking not taking down but just explaining the ways in which like things that we read can inform and do inform mm -hmm. the way that we think and perceive people absolutely you know which in this case was mexican people immigrants south south, south and central americans mm -hmm. like you know um and i'm curious about how you feel like the state of literary criticism is currently i don't think that it has changed that much um since the the publication of that essay and i think that the situation is particularly dire because of shifts in media mm -hmm. and because so many small and local outlets are withering and dying mm -hmm. and and the industry is becoming increasingly monopolistic which means we get fewer and fewer voices and those voices really need to toe a line. I mean, Ms. Magazine wanted me to say something flattering and Ms. Yeah. is not supposed to be towing the line. Right. So, um, so unfortunately, I, I wish I could say that there, I had seen like some sort of significant improvement, but I can't say that. Yeah, and I, I felt like a lot of people, your, their criticism to, towards you is that you, you couldn't have said it in a nicer way. Yeah. Which is a really strange thing to say about any type of criticism. I mean, the, the point <laughs> of a criticism is to say something not nice, right? Um, but I don't know, like, you've received a lot of, like, death threats and stuff, too, for that writing, right? I received, like, um, some pushback, and I did get one particularly weird death threat. Um, but, like, that doesn't deter me. I'm going to no, I'm going to continue um I'm going to continue doing the work that I do but yes there was a lot of ad, uh, admonishment for for not having um sort of laced my critique with sugar yeah. but I give sugar when sugar is necessary and I'm not going <laughs> to you know what I mean I'm not going to give it to people who don't deserve it so Yeah no absolutely and I think um I was just really distraught by the fact that as a reader, you know, you're just raising like factual concerns. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of what you received was just this pushback that felt like you're just not being kind. Yes. And I think to me that was like, you're missing the point. 
Yeah. <laughs> what was especially weird was like people saying, you're mean, you're mean, you're mean. You're just like that book that you wrote titled Mean. And I'm like, that's a book about me getting raped. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Like, you're mean just like your book. You know what I mean? Like, so, so I, I mean, I'm an easy target. I'm petite. <laughs> I'm female. I'm queer. Like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty easy to take jabs at. So I, it's expected. Yeah, but I feel like they don't know you punch back. Oh, yeah. Yes. And like in, in such a good way, which is like every sentence in this feels like such a good, like just examination of the reality of things and the way things are. Um, and I just loved it so much. Thank you. <laughs> I can't stop saying that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do we have any audience questions? I think we have one she here. She can go ahead and pick them up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I think I might have, we might have touched on this one already. Um, okay. Um, hello from the girl in the olive colored tank. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Your writing style is so sharp and precise that it can feel overwhelming, but only because it does not miss. How do you craft such urgency and necessity in your work? Oh my goodness. That's beautiful. That is, thank you. Um, I think that my writing style is heavily influenced by having been a high school teacher. <laughs> and I think I see a former student here. <laughs> um, and like when I taught high school and, and I taught civics and economics, there was a sense of urgency with working with young people and there was also a sense of, um, how should I put it? There is, there is like uh, this pressure when you are working with teenagers uh, that, that is, that is the sort of pressure that, um, that reminds you that like you have to, to a certain extent, keep control of the room, right? And the only way that you can really do that is to be as sharp as all of sort of the classroom characters that are present. For example, you cannot let the class clown outshine you or you've lost the class. And, um, and so when I write, I always have my former students in mind and I'm always attempting to address them. And so it's sort of like, not necessarily the ghosts of students because they're not gone, but the memories of students are constantly sort of whispering in my ear, so to speak, mm -hmm. and reminding me that, 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 that work is urgent and that it's necessary to captivate an audience. Mm -hmm. And so I, I work very, very hard at my prose because of that. And so it's, it's, it's my former students who largely inspire me. And, and you write about them in your book. And I do write about them in the book, yeah. That's and right. I love that you do that and that you write about the experiences that they have, I think, which is really important to write about. Because I think as a Mexican-American student navigating the U.S. educational system, a lot of the times, you know, a lot of the microaggressions and racism that I experienced, there was no one there to help me navigate that. Absolutely. And so when I taught... I felt as if I had to be an anchor for my racialized students. I had to be someone who they could come to um, uh, as an ally and as, a, as somebody they could commiserate with and even conspire with, right? And um, I felt the same toward my queer students. And so I was one of those teachers who would always leave her classroom open during lunch so that kids could come eat in the room as opposed to like shutting it down and going and, and eating with other teachers. Cause I was one of those nerds who ate with her teacher. Yeah. And so I need to pay it forward. <laughs> Which is honestly like, I wish I would have had that, you oh. know? Um, because I think a lot of it, you just kind of embody and swallow and absorb and it, it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. And then it shows up later in weird ways like imposter syndrome. Like <laughs> you don't feel good enough. You don't feel, you know, and I, I don't think people understand that. Absolutely. You know? um, so. Uh, we have another question. Do you think that if a male presenting individual wrote the same 
critique of American Dirt, would have gotten the, would they have gotten the same response? Um, I imagine that they probably would not have gotten the same response because um, a lot of the criticism that was aimed at me had sort of like a stereotyped patina, mm -hmm. like, oh, this Latina spitfire, the angry Latina, and it was like, oh, okay, here we go. Um, and, and there are sort of counterparts, there are stereotypical counterparts to that that are masculinized, yeah. but, um, but I, I, I think that he, he, such a figure would have been critiqued, but perhaps a little less harshly, yeah. like he wouldn't have been reminded to be nice. But I can imagine that if he had aimed that critique at, at a white woman, he would have been accused of machismo. Yeah. But also, like, I think about it, too. And I mean, nobody would have questioned whether or not his review was a blog or academia, you <laughs> yeah. know, like or academic like yeah. review. Yeah. His, his <laughs> credentials would not have been questioned yeah. the way that my credentials were questioned and continue to be questioned. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think about that a lot with the, like, yeah. Yeah, there's there's this this question about what authority I have, yeah. as if I don't have any. Yeah, right. Yeah, terrible, terrible. <laughs> um, and let me see if we have any more questions. Actually, I I did want I had a question for you. Okay. Um, I'm thinking about the difficult things that are you know really hard to kind of unpack and write about, particularly the very ending, the very yeah. ending, the very the last essay is like. It was really hard to read. Yeah. Um, so in terms of writing it and exploring, having to kind of sit down and explore and navigate mm -hmm. what you went through to write about it, mm -hmm. uh, what were some kind of therapeutic techniques that you might have like done to help you? Yeah. So, so writing about intimate partner violence, especially when you're not that far from it, is grueling. And like, of course, I have like a therapeutic relationship with, with somebody who is trauma informed and specifically informed on on IPV, but then I also relied on some other forms of therapy, um, and uh, I I spent um, I spent time self soothing through watching television, and I love to watch the same thing over and over again because of its predictability. Yeah. So um, so I binge watched a lot of TV in order to self soothe, and I admit like I'm a huge Real Housewives fanatic. So like Save. that's my life. It's like okay, which which franchise? Really? Oh my goodness! Yeah, I was gonna say Atlanta. Atlanta's mine for sure. I watched Salt Lake City for the first time the other day. I because I'm from California, and I, and I lived in Long Beach for so long. Orange County, like I, 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 I'm sorry, like, okay, <laughs> and then also um, New Jersey, because like, Teresa, you know what I mean? Like that's all I have to say is just Teresa. Um, but the other thing that I did in order to care for myself while I was working on that very difficult essay was some culinary therapy. Huh. So when you are following recipes. That's, that's, you don't really make room for anything else, yeah. like intellectually. It's just you and the instructions. Yeah. And then it's also so co corporeal, yeah. right? And you're using your hands. And when you have to focus on what you're doing with your hands, you really don't have time for like anxiety to encroach. Right. So um, I spent a lot of time cooking for myself, but also cooking for my ancestors. Because as I was working at the altar with them, they were telling me they were very hungry. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I was always making coffee for them too, because I wanted my ancestors caffeinated. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, so I spent a lot of time making food and I got very, very good at um, my chiles renos. They are, they're like so bomb. Okay, and then, um, and then my, my tortillas, I made a lot of homemade tortillas, like stacks of them. Yeah. So that was like what I would do when I just needed to like unplug yeah. was plug into maize. <laughs> I love that. That's how I did it. Yeah. I love that so much. <laughs> I mean, I, I was thinking about how Roxanne Gay had this, this uh, thing she wrote about how when she writes, she bakes. Mm. She thought to herself, it's like the perf perfect thing to do because, yeah. you know, you take 20 minutes to do the, yeah. the assembly and then 30 minutes in the oven and then you come back, right? Um, I spend time making pies, too. Really? Yeah, and my crust got really, really good. <laughs> it's super, super good. Because you got to get that right balance between the, the shortening and the butter. 
so that it's it's flaky and buttery. Yeah. Yeah. But all of that also kind of makes you focused, right? Exactly. You're not. You can't be. You can't be thinking about anything else and and like trying to bake a flaky crust. Nope. You have uh -uh. to be like. Exact. You have to be in the pie. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's really <laughs> great because if you think about like therapeutic interventions approaches, I've I've tried. It's all about being present mm -hmm. and in the moment. Right, with your senses, mm -hmm. touch, taste, smell, all of it. So I feel like that is, that's, I'm gonna do that now. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I don't know about cheddar rellenos though. I feel like that's really <laughs> intense. Like, it, it if is. You've nev if you've had one, but you've never cooked one, you need to know the intensity yeah. that it takes to cook a chile relleno. Like, yeah. It's just, there's so many layers to it. There are, <laughs> yeah. And then like just the burning from the peeling of the yeah. skins. like and smoking the skins mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Because really I do it all from scratch. So it's like your hands are burning by the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're coughing because mm -hmm. you're burning the chiles mm -hmm. to, to try to smoke them later. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's an adventure. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a reference to my great grandmother in one of the essays, and I use her recipe for the chiles. Yeah. And um, she would, like, my dad would describe her at the table eating her renos, and he said that she would have, like, a lace handkerchief, and then she would have her teeth, because she would take her teeth out, and then her, and then she would just have um, tears streaming down her face, because estaba tan enchiloso, yeah. tan picoso, so she would have like tears streaming down her face, and that she looked like a um, like a a, a a weeping statue of a saint. Yeah, like that's how how much she was enjoying her chiles. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> when you taste them, though, mm -hmm. it, they will make you cry because they're yes. they're good. They're mm -hmm. so good. Um, we have another question that okay. came in. Um, how do you approach queerness via uh, via Via, let me see if you can, via vis, the assem vis a vis the assemblages of trauma that have informed your activism and critical perspective toward heteronormative violence and anti-immigrant sentiments. Whoa. Oh my goodness. Um, so I'll say this, um, in terms of queerness and the way that queerness does or doesn't manifest in my work, um, I, I don't glamorize queerness and I don't present queer relationships as a utopian alternative to heteronormative relationships because the horror that we find in heteronormativity spills into the queer world because these worlds are enmeshed. And I don't really think that there's any way to separate the two of them. And so I do have one essay, for example, titled Waterloo, mm -hmm. which is about my experience with my former spouse. We had a queer marriage. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the emphasis of that essay isn't necessarily our queerness or our queer relationship. It's about voyaging to Iowa to meet this partner's family and the response that they have to me as somebody whose uh, race, they have a difficult time identifying. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, um, I'm the butt of all sorts of different microaggressions. And I'm wondering the entire time why I'm not being protected by the person who brought me to this place. And then I slowly come to realize, oh, I'm the curio. I'm an exotic curio who's been brought to Iowa to be put on display. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and it makes me think of like, um, Carmen Maria Machado's in mm -hmm. the dream house mm -hmm. and, and how, yeah, you're right. You know, with heteronormative relationships and, you know, um, queer relationships, like they're so, it spills in and mm -hmm. they're so tied and they're not perfect. And, mm -hmm. it, and with her, like, and what you write about too, it's like, we're exposing that, that it's not so much mm -hmm. different. And then in some cases, because it, you know, you think it's a queer relationship that those things don't happen. Exactly, you think you're insulated. There are so many phenomena that people feel insulates that in some senses um, 
I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that it does the opposite, but because of bigotry, uh, the opposite is true. For example, like, I know that there are there have been people who have asked me, like, oh my goodness, you're, you're an IPV survivor. How could that happen to somebody like you who's so strong? And I always wonder, like, doesn't somebody who asks a question like that consider that an IPV perpetrator has tastes just like everybody else? Yeah. And while some might prefer um, somebody who, who seems immediately subservient, other perpetrators might want to break somebody down, like as if, as if, as if domestic violence were almost like a sport, right? And if you're approaching it as a sport, what kind of fish do you want? A big fish or a little fish, yeah. right? So, so yeah, it, 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 is, it is strange. And, and it, connecting back to your book, I mean, it just, you could also see how easily, you know, that happens. Yes. It, and it's not some, I think we think about it as something that like, oh, you saw the red flags immediately. There's no way, like you just kind of went with it or you were in love and you didn't. I mean, sometimes it's not that that simple. And I think the creep dumb, the yes. creeping yes. that you explore in each essay is kind of, you know, uh, an example of that. Absolutely. And that was that was part of the purpose of that essay was to trace the trajectory of entrapment. Because so often um, so often these types of relationships are not treated as situations of captivity. Mm -hmm. And what I'm attempting to do is to show that uh, IPV is much more like a kidnapping, right. a very slow kidnapping, where you're being tricked time after time, and it's deliberate. Nobody perpetrates IPV on accident. Um, so yeah, so I'm trying to show that from start to finish. Well, thank you. Thank I do have you. one more question. Go what for it. Other converse, what other books would you feel like are in conversation with Creep? Um, yeah. Um, let's see. So I definitely think that um, the book that you mentioned in the dream house mm -hmm. is, is in conversation with this. Um, for people who also want to learn more about uh, IPV, I would recommend Coercive Control by Evan Stark. And I think that this book is also in conversation with all things abolitionist. Because the, although I don't explicitly express like a, an abolition position, an abolitionist position in the book, um, the police are nowhere to be found. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, even, even in you know, what the essay that you write about your rescue, right? Mm -hmm. All of that was through friends and exactly. through somebody that you knew. Exactly. Yeah, none of that involved. Uh, a police mm -hmm. yeah, at all. Well, thank you so much for writing and for sharing your story with, with us. And I feel like this is such a special book. And thank you, Lupita. I'm so grateful for you all for um, being here and joining us for this conversation. Thank you so much, everybody. Mm. Um, and I th you're, you're going to be signing books yeah. right here. So um, 